I will be describing to you argon's develop, development of ice slurry coolants, in particular coolants that can be used to improve the energy utilization efficiency. In particular, uh, associated with large multiple building complexes such as in downtown Chicago. I will also describe very briefly our translation of this research on how to make these coolants into the medical arena where we're currently uh, delivering these coolants deep within the body uh, to be used to protect organs such as the brain and the heart and the kidney during surgeries or unplanned medical emergencies. The uh, work or the talk outline is as follows. I'll be initially describing what is an ice slurry coolant. In particular, I'll then go over our building applications and then uh, briefly our medical applications, a little bit that the facilities that we have for doing this type of work. And finally, I'll talk ab uh, about our current proposal in with the U.S. Department of Energy in the area of building technologies where we have a multi-million dollar proposal in to have a demonstration at Argon on implementing advanced cooling with slurries at our building site. So some background, uh, we've been developing these phase change slurries, uh, basically ice slurry coolants for building and medical applications. We started basically under the Department of Energy funding back in the, the late 1980s and going into the, the 1990s for buildings. We then, uh, about six years ago, seven years ago, started translating what we had learned here about making slurries into developing slurries that could be used medically in the medical arena. And in that area then we went to basically in the NIH and we had a four million dollar five-year grant with the University of Chicago where we shared, we worked with doctors and we were the engineering part of that work. The fundamental understanding though of a slurry cooling uh, is basically applicable to both areas. It, it translates very nicely between these two things. Very big scale, very small scale. Uh, why slurries? If you have ice particles that are very, very small in a carrier liquid, basically the heat of fusion you have a very high loading of ice is 80 calories per gram. So for every gram of coolant that you deliver, you basically can absorb 80 calories of heat. If you're trying to do that with single phase uh, fluids like chilled water, uh, you cool one degree centigrade. You basically, for one gram, you only absorb one calorie. So you'll see when I start talking about building cooling, if we're talking about cooling energy storage, instead of having a million gallon tank, we can have tanks that are as small as one-tenth of that. So early on, basically into the, the early 1980s, people had thought about cooling uh, buildings with pumped ice slurry instead of chilled water. They were only able to get to ice loadings up to about 15 percent. They'd start getting plugging of pipes, inability to take it out of storage tanks. And so it, it really didn't go anywhere. And then DOE started funding us and we did some basic research, actually looked at the slurries at the micro scale level at the individual ice particles and found out what were the characteristics of those slurries which basically dictated the engineering behavior of what we were trying to do with them. And I'll, I'll briefly I'll tell you a little bit about that. So this is an example of, of what is a good slurry and what is a bad slurry. We are not making 7-Eleven Slurpees. I can guarantee you. Uh, on the left, this is 7-Eleven Slurpee. So this is, uh, it's green because we put in some food coloring to make it easy to see. But it's basically pure water. We've ground up large ice chunks to quite small size. In fact, less than a tenth of a millimeter in size. We try pouring them through and we get all the water and all the ice stays behind. Our slurry has to be such that the carrier liquid carries the particles where we want them to go easily without plugging. So if you look under a, a cold cell microscope uh, th arrangement, we have apparatus, there are two types of ice that get you into trouble. You have dendritic ice, and again, these are very small dendrites. These are less than a tenth of a millimeter. They're long, as high aspect ratios, ratios. They have a lot of sharpnesses along the edges. And basically, at the high loadings, they entangle, and you can't pour them. You can't use them. You can also get in trouble. Uh, with globular, these are globular ice particles, not spherical, but fairly uh, spherical. 
And these dark bands, these are backlit ice particles, they're all surface refractions, basically light refraction, which in indicates microscale surface roughness. So we have developed methods, basically, rough ice particles, bad slurry, if you do the same water and pour in it like some freezing point depressant, like sodium chloride, ethylene glycol, or in medical applications, other freezing point depressants. During the production process, you can actually go from globular particles to particles that are globular, but the microscale surface roughness is worn away and melted. And so when you take this slurry and make it, again, at very high ice loading, it pours straight through. So that simple idea is, is what has allowed us to make slurries now that we are pumping in, in industrial types of systems at 50% and greater loadings, and we're delivering deep through small catheters into the body at very high loadings as well, without plugging like this. So here's a, an example of some of the, the, the micro-scale work. This is a cold cell which is refrigerated. We in, introduce a slurry by pump. This is a long-range microscope. And in the back is a video image of the actual ice particles. We can see what happens when we put in freezing point depressants. We can actually watch the microscale features melt away in, in a short period of time. So we've studied that. Also on a small scale, if you have rough ice particles, you can ask the question, if I have a highly loaded ice particles in a liquid and you want to stir it, what is the mixing energy that I need to put in there to keep it effectively mixed? And this is a very simple example, but it illustrates, in this case here, ice loading. In this case here, the RPM required to mix effectively top to bottom in the beaker. If I have plain water, basically no glycol, very quickly, uh, at 10% loading, I run out, out of ability to mix it. It just won't mix. The particles are all tangled up. If I start increasing the freezing point depressant level, half a percent up to 3%, dramatically, I smooth the particles, and I also am able to mix it out to loadings up to 40%. Another uh, example of what we're doing in small scale to study slurry production procedures, as well as how we make slurries for medical applications. This is a simple apparatus where we, we make slurries in here and we evaluate the different parameters that affect our ability to pump with the peristaltic pump, the slurry. This is medical stuff. This is a catheter that would go into your femoral vein. This is a catheter here, which is about 100 centimeters long, that a cardiac surgeon would push up your femoral vein into the heart to protectively cool in the future. So here we're pumping a very thick slurry. This is about 48% loading of ice in carrier liquid through this long catheter with no plugging. An example of how we'll be using it in the future, this is an example of a catheter being pushed into a blockage in a major blood vessel on the heart. And they're going to be doing a balloon angioplasty, and we will be protectively cooling just before they open up the, the, the artery to prevent what they call reperfusion damage. Uh, this is another example of medical cooling where uh, we're working with laparoscopic uh, kidney surgeons, minimally invasive surgery, in which we pump slurry made from an outside source through a small tube. We go through a laparoscopic port into the stomach cavity. This is a delivery tube where this is slurry being pumped. Under there is a kidney that's being protectively cooled, getting ready for a cancerous growth removal. When they do these surgeries, they basically have to clamp the kidney off. There's no blood flow, no blood flow, there's no oxygen, the organ starts dying. We cool it to basically reduce the metabolism rate and reduce the need for oxygen. So let's get back to the building applications. In our lab at Argonne, we have, for large-scale building development and research, we have a facility which we can make slurry, we can pump it, we can store it. These are 1,000-gallon tanks, so that we go from small one-millimeter catheters right on up to 1,000-gallon tanks. We can make the slurry, store it, pump it with pumps, look at whether it plugs the piping system, and then store its ability to be moved to another site. You'll see when I talk about the argon ice slurry demonstration that we've proposed to DOE for buildings, that you'll see these sort of features in a, a building schematic of what we're trying to develop. Here is the hardware located here. These are the 1,000-gallon tanks. So we make slurry by different means. We, we explore ways to smooth the ice particles at the micro-scale level, 
so we can affect the behavior at the macro scale engineering level. In the facility, we've shown that you can basically, if correctly uh, produced slurry is stored, you can extract it from the, the tanks over 24 hours later without the particles freezing together. You can get it out of the tanks. You can then pump it at very high loadings without uh, plugging up the piping system that connects this tank, for example, to this tank here, or this building here to this building here, if you, if you get into buildings. If you store in a tank uh, of this size, 40 to 60 percent ice loading, you can reduce the size of the storage tank you need roughly to one-tenth its size. So, for example, in downtown Chicago, there's some uh, chilled water storage tanks that are up, up to a half a million gallons. Instead of a half a million gallons, you can buy a tank that's one-tenth that size. If you want to pump the slurry basically through pipes, you can reduce the size of the pipes down to about a third of what they would normally be if you were trying to pump chilled water and satisfy a cooling load. So what are we trying to do? Well, uh, we have been developing this again going back to the, the, the early 90s with DOE funding. But in the interim, basically, there wasn't much energy uh, cost pressure on cooling people in the United States. And so most of the work that's been going on after we finished with the DOE funding in this area has been by Japan and Korea. Uh, they were forced basically by higher energy costs to do something. And they actually have had researchers at Argonne working in, in, in our equipment. We believe the time is right now to advance this technology in the USA. And so uh, basically a month ago, we submitted to the Department of Energy a multi-million dollar proposal to basically have a demonstration in which we hook up multiple buildings at Argonne and we make ice in a central location and pump it out to various buildings on site for cooling. The team that we've proposed for the work involves uh, us researchers. It involves hopefully uh, faculty and students here from the Northwestern University. It involves our physical plant people, basically the HVAC uh, engineers and operators. We've already had interactions with uh, Johnson Controls and with basically uh, uh, Commonwealth Edison in, in Chicago on the matter. Some private sector energy uh, provider firms that would possibly be the operators of these things once we've demonstrated it at Argonne. And so what, what is it we're going to build at Argonne? What we've proposed to the Department of Energy is there will be a central plant at the Argonne site. It will make slurry and have a very large storage tank using the procedures that we've been developing over the years. It can make the slurry on off-peak hours so that we can basically charge this up at nighttime, getting energy reduction rates. We can build this up with a highly loaded slurry. And then the next uh, morning, mid-morning or so, when the heating loads start going up, when the electrical rates start getting high, we can deliver slurry made the night before through a distribution system buried in the streets, under the roads. And we have two types of loads that we'll be interacting with. One load is uh, what we call a retrofit load. You've got existing buildings. You can't go in there and tear out all the old equipment many times and put in equipment that will handle the slurry you want to basically retrofit. So we would just bring the slurry into that building through an appropriate design heat exchanger, and then it would interact with the existing cooling equipment, so reducing costs on retrofit. If you're building a totally new building, which we're starting to build some new buildings now at Argonne, the building could be designed to take the slurry, basically have its own storage tank, and then distribute it internally into air handlers. So it's this proposal that we have basically been uh, put into the Department of Energy. At the end of the demonstration, which we believe will take something of order six years if fully funded, we expect to have the following outcomes. We will have trained engineers in, in this new cooling technology. It's more energy efficient and, and yields operation and equipment cost reductions. You can imagine going from a million gallon tank to a one-tenth size or piping five feet in diameter down a piping that's a foot and a half in diameter, big cost reductions. And that would be improvements basically over the current uh, base chilled water individual cooling systems that are currently separated and not really hooked together. 
we would have developed the, the improved engineering understanding further what is the best way to optimize the ice generation system to make a slurry, what is the best way to condition the slurry particles at the micro scale so that at the macro scale we get the correct engineering properties in a large distribution system, do it economically as well. And most importantly for the DOE, our work started out with them in the, in the late 18, 1980s into the early 1990s. We pioneered making slurries. We could now show transfer to the private sector. And I think DOE would hopefully look forward to showing successful implementation. We believe that uh, Northwestern University students and faculty could be a big help in, in helping us move this forward, transferring the technology. Thank you.